I was brushing my teeth this morning, don't we all? And as I'm looking at myself in the mirror, I thought, I'm getting a bit scruffy, looking a bit reckless here. And it got me thinking about barbarians. Some time ago, a few months ago, I was browsing through the interweb and I found this article and I'm going to put it up on screen right here, right now, and I'll talk through it a little bit. I want to read this whole thing to you. The point of this video is just to talk a little bit about the Barbarian class for 5th edition D&D. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the subclasses, but most importantly about a bit of the inspirations, the things that from either the player or the Dungeon Master point of view that might spark some interest and make this seemingly one-trick pony a little more exciting and bring a little more to the table. Let's jump into this. Well met everyone, I am Rich the Lich, and before we jump into this barbarian video, I wanna just handle a couple of orders of business first. First off, thank you so much to Jake Hargreaves for donating to me on Patreon. Thank you so much for your contribution towards my efforts. Also, coming later this week, I've got a couple of sponsored or review copies that I need to cover, so we'll be talking about those, and those videos will be up. And then, of course, as always, more good stuff when we're talking about Dungeons and Dragons, the perspective from a dungeon master, and inspiration, and so on. So that jumps us right into today's video. To begin this, what I'm going to do is I want to read this article that I found. This article is titled, How Vikings Went Into a Trance-Like Rage Before Battle. And I think the combination of what I remember reading from this article and looking at my own Viking-like image, I guess, we're going to ramble a little bit about the barbarian. So ethnobotanists have a new theory on which plant the berserkers ingested. Here we go. <clears throat> The legendary Viking warriors known as Berserkers were renowned for their ferocity in battle, purported, purportedly fighting in a trance-like state of blind rage, howling like wild animals, biting their shields, and often unable to distinguish between friend and foe in the heat of battle. Sounds like barbarian rage, right? But historians know very little about the Berserkers apart from scattered Old Norse myths and epic sagas. One intriguing hypothesis as to the source of their behavior is that the Berserkers ingested a specific kind of mushroom with psychoactive properties. Now, an ethnobotanist is challenging that hypothesis, suggesting in a recent paper in the Journal of Blaguer that Henbane is a more likely candidate. Accounts of the Berserkers date back to a late 9th century poem to honor King Harald Fairhair. The 13th century Icelandic historian poet Snorri Sturluson described Odin's berserkers as being mad as dogs or wolves and strong as bears or wild oxen, killing people with a single blow. Specific attributes can vary widely among the accounts, often veering into magic or mysticism. Now we're starting to get into very D&D-esque type stuff, right? There are claims that berserkers were not affected by edge weapons or fire, resistance, but they could be killed with clubs. Perhaps that's some old school D&D stuff. I don't remember enough of the older iterations of D&D in the distinctions between piercing and whatnot, but there you go. Other claims say they, they could blunt the blades of their enemies with spells or just by giving them the evil eye. Most accounts at least agree on the primary defining characteristic, a blind, ferocious rage. There it is, straight up. The onset of Berserker Gang purportedly began with bodily chills, shivering, and teeth chattering, followed by swelling and reddening of the face. Then the rage broke out, and once it abated, the Berserker would experience both physical fatigue and emotional numbness for a few days. No coincidence that you have those effects oftentimes, like exhaustion stuff after rage, right? Several hypotheses have been proposed for why the warriors would have behaved this way, including self-induced hysteria, aided by biting their shields and howling, epilepsy, ergot poisoning, or mental illness. One of the more hotly contested hypothesis, hypotheses is that the berserkers ingested a hallucinogenic mushroom, commonly known as fly agaric, just before battle to induce their trance-like state. Almost done here, folks. Another page or two. A. Muscaria has a distinctly Alice in Wonderland appearance with its bright red cap and white spots. While it's technically toxic to humans, the mushrooms are apparently safe to ingest after parboiling them twice. A. Muscaria was very popular as an intoxicant among Siberian tribes, possibly holding religious significance because of its psychoactive properties. The latter aspect is due to two compounds, ibotenic acid and muscimol, with muscarine 
first discovered in 1869, most likely responsible for some of the more unpleasant side effects. The shroom typically induces a drunken state with auditory illusions and shifts in color vision. It can also induce vomiting, hyperthermia, sweating, reddening of the face, twitching and trembling, dilated pupils, increased muscle tone, delirium, and seizures. Much of that is consistent with accounts of berserker behavior. But according to Karsten Fatur, an ethnobotanist at the university in Slovenia, henbane is a much better candidate. It's been around since ancient Greece and has been used in various cultures throughout history as a narcotic painkiller, cure for insomnia, and anesthetic. It's a common treatment for motion sickness and can produce short-term memory loss. It can knock out someone for 24 hours, and in rare cases, henbane can lead to respiratory failure. It's also been investigated as a possible truth serum. Henbane even found its way into early European beers, gradually being replaced with hops after the passage of the Bavarian Purity Law in 1516. Fatur argues that while both the mushrooms and henbane can account for increases in strength, altered consciousness, delirium jerking and twitching, and red face commonly associated with the berserkers, aggressive rage is not common with the mushroom. Fatur cites several cases involving angry behavior associated with plants related to henbane containing the same alkaloids. This anger can rage can range from agitation to full-blown rage and combativeness depending on the dosage and the individual's mental set, he wrote. As this is perhaps the most defining component of the berserker state, this symptom is of central importance in identifying the potential causes and provides a very critical reason as to why H. Niger, which I believe is the sort of scientific name for this henbane stuff, is a more appropriate theoretical intoxicant for the berserkers than A. muscaria. Henbane can also dull pain, hence the accounts of berserkers being nearly invulnerable, contribute to an inability to recognize faces, cause removal of clothing. So let's just back up on these real quick. Dulling pain, there's your resistance. The contribution of its inability to recognize faces, it's kind of one of those, I don't, I have to look and digest the fifth edition variants of it, or version I should say, but where you would attack something, including friend, if there were no longer any foes nearby. Causes removal of clothing. Perhaps that leads itself to the barbarian not wearing any clothing. Maybe there's some inspiration here for that, or not wearing armor, I should say, right? And lower blood pressure, which Fatur suggests might account for the asser- assertion that berserkers didn't lose much blood when injured with blades. And berserkers purportedly suffered from numerous side effects for several days following that battle high. Here's the the downfall after you come off of a rage, right? The mushrooms typically don't produce lingering side effects. Henbane does, including headache, dilated pupils, and blurred vision. Fatter suggests that A. muscaria would have been much more rare in Scandinavia. It typically grows in forests, since it flourishes in a symbiotic relationship with tree roots. Henbane, in contrast, grows rapidly as a weed and is known to have flourished in Scandinavia during the Berserker era. And a woman's grave in Denmark, dating back to about 980, included a pouch of henbane seeds, along with clothing and jewelry, according to Fatur. Naturally, a few caveats are in order. There are elements of berserker behavior that henbane cannot account for, such as the biting of shields and chattering teeth. And Fatur notes that much of this is speculative, since there simply isn't sufficient archaeological or historical evidence to prove or disprove his hypothesis. He himself has no specific expertise in history or archaeology, so the ethnobotanist is calling on future research by those communities to confirm or disprove his unique ethnobotanical perspective. So, That says a lot right there, without further delving too much into this and digesting that. There's certainly some inspiration here. I'm not going to say, I'm not putting the words in the mouth of the Watsi and D&D designers, whether this is where it came from, but there's a lot of things here that make sense. And I think the point of this video and the beauty of this is to always look and search outside of what you might think as a as a catalyst and a means for helping create a more compelling and more interesting character. On paper, the barbarian can oftentimes feel almost very one-trick pony, very clear-cut and dry, right? When when you look at it in comp- certainly in contrast or comparison, I should say, to the battle master fighter. There's a lot more moving parts where the barbarian just feels I've heard as sort of a point of contention when, hey, you want to play a barbarian, to those that are quite fond of melee combat and things like that, they don't want to play any kind of a caster. I've heard many players, prospective players, or those that are interested in barbarians say, 
they're just going to get bored with the barbarian. It feels like they just charge into combat and they swing an axe, and that's all they do. And yes, you can look to inspiration and what we've seen in media, Conan the Barbarian, right? There's a reason why he's named that, and Arnold's depiction of that sort of monstrosity of, you know, physical beast-like nature. But I think when you look a little bit deeper into the complexity of something like a William Wallace versus Conan, although Conan did have aspects of that, you can look into sort of an alternate source that fuels their rage, just like we have this article here that talks about sort of a drug that's creating this, right? The hallucinogenic effect of this henbane or whatever it may be, or even the first one, which was the A. muscaria, the mushroom things. But when you look at William Wallace, you almost see there's a recklessness there because he lost his loved one, right? He lost everything that he had. So he has just sort of a giant case of the efforts at this point where it doesn't matter, right? I'm, I know that I can't win this battle. Scotland is not going to completely remove the entire influence of England at that time. But it, it was an uprising, right? It, it brought it inspired others to sort of chase that dream as well. And Conan had certain elements of that, right? Of just sort of how he grew up and watching the beginnings of that movie. And in the beginning when Thulsa Doom kills, I think, his father, right? And he's a little boy and he captures him and, you know, you will contemplate this on the tree of woe. And he he goes out, he, you know, he's laid out for torture and whatnot. And they, there are certainly things that can fuel that idea of why are you so reckless? Why are you so willing to wade into battle and take damage? I like the little bits here where it kind of talks about it affecting blood pressure and blood flow, where it almost felt like these guys didn't bleed. But I think that sort of the, the social stigma or the sort of the, what is the word? The boogeyman or the fear that maybe savages and barbarians in your D&D world can bring about is almost kind of like to the common folk, it seems like these guys can't be hurt, right? They barely bleed. They get wounded, but yet they still keep going. And that could just simply be indicative of the D12 and the fact that they have so many damn hit points. And yet they don't seem to be wading into battle as a massive, what I call it is the walking box of metal in Warhammer fantasy where you have the dwarves, right? That are all armored up where you can't see it. There's no semblance of any dwarven nature in there. It looks like just a box of metal. Yet you have these barbarians that are wading into the front lines of combat to take damage, but yet they're doing it basically half naked, wearing furs around their waist and some shawl with a wolf's head on the top. And that's about it. Look at Wolfgar from R.A. Salvatore's books, right? The barbarian always has that feeling and that effect. But what I like about this is as I said, when you come to the table and you're thinking the barbarian doesn't seem like it has a lot to offer, and whether you're going into the path of the berserker, right? And yes, you can go down the path of the ancients or whatever it might be, or the, the bear totem guy, the totem guardian or whatever he's called, where you're really mitigating almost all damage except for basically psychic. You can definitely tie into that durability aspect, that survivability where he's just insanely hard to kill, plus he has a bunch of hit points. But also, when you're looking at just the simple berserker thing, and, well, what does your barbarian do? Well, I just always engage in combat. Well, why do you do that? Well, I just engage in combat because I have so many hit points. And all I want to do is I want to go reckless. So I want to get advantage in all my attacks, and I don't care if you're hitting me with advantage. I'm probably going to get hit anyway because my armor class is not full plate mail, blah, 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 like the paladin might be. So I'd rather give myself the best chance to hit. But instead of just keeping everything sort of one trick pony or sort of playing your character as though thinking there's not a lot to it because mechanically on paper it doesn't have as many moving parts as the the battle master as i said you can certainly have a reason as to why do you act that way and little articles like this not just from the dm perspective yes they provide me with a wealth of inspiration for how i might be able to run one of my savage barbarian tribes in the north and what is the general perception of this tribe similar to what happened with the movie 13th warrior right where you have this almost godlike stature this boogeyman feared group of people but until you know antonio banderas and all of the other vikings that were fighting against them realized wait a minute they they ble they bleed just like us you know the predator concept if it bleeds we can kill it once you break through that barrier of these things are invulnerable and they're immortal, things like this might give you a bit of a reason to help bring a little bit of depth and a little bit of, as I always talk about, complexity and layers to your barbarian. So play Path of the Berserker. 
but don't just rely on the simplicity of what's on your character sheet and say, well, the wizard with all of his divination magic is so much more complex in what he can do. And the battle master fighter is so much more complex. And the arcane trickster rogue has a lot more moving parts and little, you know, a lot more finesse and elegance where my guy just goes in, I get advantage, you get advantage against me, let's hit and let's just keep going until we're all dead or until, you know, whatever, right? But the behind the scenes of that is look at Braveheart, look at Mel Gibson's, the catalyst in his mind. And I think you can bring about and maybe incorporate background elements and other just simple background notes that are not really in the book, but just some reasons as to why you act the way you do. And I think what this type of article has sort of sparked for me, and hopefully it does for players as well, is it shows you that You can use various things, whether you read them, whether you see them, whether it's something you heard on a YouTube video or a friend said something, you can use so many different aspects, especially if you pull from what fictional characters through various media scream barbarian to you, Conan, of course. You can simply look at the artwork by Frank Fazetta, right? You can look at Mel Gibson, William Wallace, and Braveheart, you know, did... Maximus ever become almost barbarian like after his wife and son were killed by uh is it Commodus you know whoever it was walking phoenix right you know what superhero characters feel more whether it's juggernaut or just simply hulk when he's mad is that barbarian but you can use those things but i think when just as as happened with hulk in the marvel movies when you realize the sort of dichotomy or the dilemma that bruce banner had with hulk it endeared you into the character a little more and it gave that character a lot more layers of depth and complexity that rivaled something like the issues that Tony Stark was going through. Or as we watched Wolverine, who has a very barbarian, rage-like aspect in his combat, but as you start watching Logan and things like this, you start to quickly realize there's a lot going on there behind the scenes, even though my character sheet says, great axe, a lot of hit points, charge into combat, kill them before they kill me, and that's it. So hopefully this whole ramble kind of gave you just a little bit of fuel and a little, a few things to think about. So what are your thoughts? That's what I have for you folks. Thanks everyone for watching and take care.